Yeah, they're not noisy at all. Solomon has finished instructing the people how to build a temple. He's finished moving everybody into the temple. And now it's time to dedicate the temple. We'll be walking through 1st and 2nd Chronicles understanding a little bit more about worship. By understanding this concept of this temple that was built uh, so many years ago. The temple is not the same. Not the same as a church. It was a visible reminder to the people that, oh yeah, God is with us. They would look up at this building and be reminded that yes, God is present, and if God is present here, then that's going to make a really big difference in everything I do. They've done some hard work, and now they've gotten there. And they understand, they've got this image that is built there. They've gone through some hard work, and God has led them to something that is better. You're trying to get my attention here. Okay. Sometimes you don't know quite what's happening in the seminar. Okay. A number of years ago, when, when um, Tim was a lot younger, he had a little bit of a problem digesting milk, a little bit of milk intolerance. And uh, in the midst of all this, we went down to uh, Disneyland. And I remember going to this fancy hotel where they had this buffet where you, you could meet all the characters. And uh, I was quite excited. I remember him getting a sword fight with Peter Pan. It was, it was lots of fun. Uh, but as we're going through this buffet, we said, okay, we got one boy who can't do milk, and the chef came out and walked him through and said, you can eat this, this, but don't eat that, that, that. And got to desserts, and he said, don't eat any of them. Now, he's about what? I don't know, what was he, about seven, eight, somewhere in there. You can't tell a seven or eight-year-old boy, you know, no desserts, right? Not a buffet. No, whatever else seems. At the end of the meal, came out with a special dessert that he had made just for Tim. Put it in front of him. It looked the best, and we all tasted it. It tasted better than anything else on the buffet. He went through the hard times, but he got the best because he did. You know, sometimes when we go through the hard times, we end up with the best. And that's the exact point of having the presence of God there. They're going through the toughest to get to the best because God has got a blessing for them. And a blessing is not, this is really important, the blessing is not that God's going to give them everything they want. The blessing is not that everything's going to go well. The blessing is not even that they're going to know love, hope, and patience, and peace, and all the things that God promised. The blessing is they are going to know God himself. That they have God himself there in their presence. And as we know God, it changes everything. Because God gives us eternal life. And I've, I've several times over the years said that eternal life is not meaning that we live for a long time. Eternal life means our life comes from the eternal realms. That God has a life for us. That it's tied to him. So we better know something about God to understand something about the life that we have in him. It's mind-boggling sometimes to think about there's many who do not care to know anything about the life that God has for them. But for those who do, for those who want to know eternal life, better understand God. Because if I see God as the giver of life, it's going to change everything. It's going to give me hope and purpose. You know what? God created each one of us. God made us. God made us in his own image, it even says. So therefore, the life that he has is going to be tied into God. You know, we may have an understanding of ourselves. You may think of yourself a certain way. You may think of yourself, and you might describe yourself with certain words. Some of them might be positive words. 
Some of the words that you might use to describe yourself might be negative. They might be along the realm more of maybe I'm unfortunate. Or I'm unloved. Or I'm without hope. Even you fill in the blank. Do you know what? Those words don't matter. Because what matters is how God sees you. And how God sees you is a reflection of how he sees himself because he is the one who created us in his own image. And therefore, we're going to look at a few words real quick that Solomon uses to describe God because they end up becoming a reflection on how we're going to understand ourselves. And I'm going to go through this real quick. You can follow along First or Second Chronicles chapter 6. I read a little piece of it. It's a really long path. It's a long path. It's a beautiful prayer. It's worth reading in its whole. We're not actually going to do it through the sermon this morning because we'd spend our entire time just doing that. But I want to, I want to point out nine things that Solomon says about God. And then we're not going to spend a lot of time on each of these nine points. In fact, less than a minute on some of them. But to understand a little bit about this is our God. And this is the God who's given us eternal life. This is the God who's created us in his own image. This is the God we need to understand because it tells us a lot about where we are going as people who follow him. It starts off understanding that God is a God of promise. Solomon, in the portion that I did read, spends a lot of time saying, God, this is what you said you were going to do. And you promised you were going to reign forever, which he does through Jesus. And in verse 17, he says, Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, let your word be confirmed. It is a joyful call. God, you, you promised this. And therefore, you're going to do it. You have said it, therefore it is a guarantee that it will happen. Particular, this whole idea of you have promised that there will be a king on the throne of David forever and ever, and is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. We have a king. And God is a God of promise. When God says something, it is a guarantee it will happen. He points out that we have a God not just of power, but a God who listens. A God who listens. He's particularly talking about prayer. Said Solomon was down on this table, much bigger table that he had. He's, he's, he's on this table, he's kneeling down in front of all the people, hands way up in the air. I don't know how he kept his hands in the air in the air for this whole prayer, because it's a long prayer. But anyways, he's younger, I guess, at this stage of his life. He's got the potential. He's holding his hands up in prayer. And he is marveled by the fact that God is going to listen to those prayers. And all the people are staring at him. I don't know who's all there. It says all of Israel. Probably not everybody made it. A lot of people in thousands are watching. Maybe even tens of thousands. I don't know. All those thousands of people are watching. Solomon is standing there saying, we have the right to come talk to you. Now, among all those tens of thousands of people, how many of them had the right to come talk to Solomon? Probably not very many, right? He probably has, you know, we, we just have a picture of him up on this table, but he probably has, you know, the secret service all around him, right? He's got handlers. He's got the, the people of the court. Now, in those days, kings probably were a little more approachable than they'd be today, but the vast majority cannot approach the king and just talk to him. And he's standing there, or he's kneeling there with his hands outstretched, saying in front of all these people who can't approach him, saying, God, you listen. You listen to me. It says this in verses 18 19. Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I built, yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea. <clears throat> In other 
words. Solomon's not just saying, you listen to me. He's saying, you're even bigger than me, and you still listen to everyone. We have a God who listens. We have a God of justice as well. He goes on from there, beyond what I finished reading er a little earlier, that there is an exception to those he's going to listen. He says, you treat people, mistreat people, you treat them unfairly, particularly those who are disadvantaged, you come, you're going to find justice. We have a God of justice. A God who holds us to account and brings justice to our world. And he will not hear the one who lacks that justice. But, but, who who's, who acts unjustly? Who acts poorly? Probably all of us, right? Do you know what the next thing Solomon's going to pray for? That we have a God of forgiveness. I don't think it's any coincidence that Solomon's praying. The first thing he prays is we all do wrong. Then he goes on to pray that we have a God of forgiveness. Verse 20, hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your people. We all lack justice. He could stand there with punishment. Instead, he stands there with forgiveness. We have a God of blessing. It's a remarkable one. He goes on to pray, you know, there's going to be eventually a time where the rain doesn't fall. Crops are going to dry up. Not going to look good. Now, you may have noticed as you came in this morning, our parking lot has no lack of moisture. I'll tell you, on Friday, as we got to the end of all the rain, I was walking across the parking lot and sinking and thinking, oh man, I hope it's dry between now and Sunday. I think we can get through it at the moment. Well, that's, this might not be this, at least for our parking lot, this might not be this year, but he says, there will be a year in which there is no rain. He's not just thinking, as he's praying this, that there'll be a year of famine. He's also thinking that there might be times where the blessings of God are blocked. Because rain can become symbolic of the blessings of God falling. What blocks the blessings of God? It's our sin. It's our unbelief. It's our struggles. He says that when there becomes famine, then we can seek the rain and we're going to find the fullness of the pleasure of God, that God can even break through and bring blessings to our lives. What did I say was the greatest blessing? It's his presence. It's knowing Jesus himself. He can break through when there's struggles, when there's times that are hard. And he goes on and he prays about a God of rending an interesting word. Let me read a little, a little bit of a longer piece, starting in verse 29. Whatever prayer, whatever plea is made by any man or by all your people Israel, each knowing his own affliction and his own sorrow and stretching out his hand toward this house, then hear from heaven your dwelling place and forgive and render to each whose heart you know, according to all his ways, for you, you alone, you only, Know the hearts of the children of mankind, that they may fear you and walk in all your ways, and sorry, walk in your ways all the days that they live in the land that you gave to our forefathers. In the presence of God, we can know God Himself. And sometimes, as, as, you, as you read through this passage, sometimes God's gonna allow things to go wrong so that we can be forced to stay close to God, because the greatest blessing we have is to know God, and if we wander far away from Him, even though we might have to make our lives a tad uncomfortable, there is a lot more value to staying close to Him than to being comfortable. So He may do things to push us back on the right path. That's His presence. read this quote this week. If the gospel only brought us forgiveness, escape from hell, or to eternal life, that in itself would not be the good news. The glory of the gospel 
is that Jesus brings us to God. This word rendi, I read it and I was thinking, what exactly is he trying to say? Now, this is uh, the English Standard Translation of the, the New Testament. It says something different in different translations. I was thinking that, that I was thinking rend, kind of meaning tear, and I looked it up, and it, it's actually not what it meant. It actually is a word that means cause to become. That God is a God who wants you to become something. Now, what is that something like him? Because we were created to be in his image. Sin has marred that. Sin has kept us from being in his image. And God wants us to be in his image. So what does he do? He does things in our life to cause us to be more like him. We have a God of rending or a God of causing. We have a God who creatively is at work to make you into the person that he wants you to be. And how is he going to do that? By bringing us into his presence, because that is the ultimate aim of Christianity, is to be close to God. He changes us by bringing him close to him. He's also a God of mission. He says that one of the goals of the temple was so that others would call out your name in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you. We have a God who wants to bring the entire world into his love. Now, it may never happen. A lot of people are going to reject him. That's what the Gospels say over and over again. There's going to be people who hear the good news and they reject it. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't want the good news to go into the whole world. That's the God who we're called to, is a God of mission. We have a God of repentance. Just finish talking about forgiveness. Just talking about the work that he does in our lives to make us more like him. He goes on and prays about, you know, this desire that the whole world knows God. Then he comes back to repentance. You know, if this was and I think it is, a prayer that is, has everything in a specific order. We have a God promise, a God who's going to hear us, a God who looks down, he has justice, but he also has forgiveness, a God who's bringing us somewhere to his blessing, a God who is causing us to become a God a mission. And then we come back to repentance. Isn't that something that's supposed to be the beginning? That I realize I've done wrong and I repent of my sins, and then I got God's forgiveness. Shouldn't it be in the middle there somewhere? And yet here we have it towards the end. Because, you know what? As we all go through the Christian life, we will eventually mess up. And we need to come back to God. And when we mess up, he is saying, you are God who still hears. Still the God of hears. Verse 37. If they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive and repent and plead with you in the land of their captivity, saying, We have sinned and have acted perversely and wickedly. If they repent with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their captivity to which they were carried captive and pray toward their land, which you gave to their fathers, the city that you have chosen and the house that I have built for your name, then hear from heaven. Your dwelling place, their prayers, and their pleas, and maintain their cause, and forgive. Forgive your people who sinned against you. Isn't that great? You ever messed up? It's still a God of forgiveness. Even though we should know better, it's still a God of forgiveness. One more point, God is God of presence. This is a lot of stuff for a short sermon. Probably would be better suited over nine whole weeks. But he finishes saying, God would want to live in your presence. Solomon is praying. 
this table in front of the altar so everybody can see him, praying to God on their behalf and in front of everyone, basically saying, God, we want you, we want the power of God, we want the love, we want the joy, we want the hope, we want to make a difference for the kingdom of this God in this world. And how do we do it? It's because we desperately want See, it's all about life. It's all about everything that God has for us. And when he gives us his presence, he's given us his life. Often the church has gone, and I'm not just saying us, I think the church as a whole has gone astray that we make Christianity all about rules. It's not about rules. It's about life. It's about life. It's about God bringing us life from the eternal realms. And it's only possible to understand that when we live in the presence of God and it's possible. Solomon is saying basically to the people, here's your God. He's praying, saying all these attributes of God, all these things he's learned about God, all these things he knows about God. He's up there praying these things. Take up, people. Take the blessing of the presence of God. Live in his presence. Because it's going to make all the difference. Live in his presence. Day in and day out. This whole exercise of building the temple is all about understanding that the presence of God is in our midst. Don't wander off. Don't live in the stresses of this world. Don't get so caught up with the, the worries of this life that you're going to miss the fact that he has life for you. Don't get caught up with the sins that entrap. Don't get caught up with all the things that, that just pull you away. Live daily in worship. <coughs> live daily trying to understand the worship that you can live in. Really, that worship is living in the presence of God. Do that every day. We're going to come to the communion table, <coughs> which is an opportunity again to do that. To understand the price was paid to bring us to the presence of God. And as we do so, reliving it so, that we understand again what it means to be in the presence of God. I'm going to invite those who are serving communion to come forward.